Good morning. My name is uh, Vinoy. Today I will uh, talk to you about some of the non-conventional approaches for building microsystems. As you may recall, we have talked about bulk micro machining for several geometries, uh, microsystems, such as uh, in the for the for example, for the case of pressure sensors, to build grooves or channels, to build tips for you know AFM and things like that. You know, even for building cantilever kind of geometries, with uh, you know there is a cavity with a cavity below such geometries. We have also talked about surface micro machining, which essentially consists of adding uh, at least two layers above the silicon substrate. The first layer being called this sacrificial layer, which will be etched to create the window for uh, in, uh, including the anchor for the structural layer and the sacrificial layer will be eventually removed to create room for the structure, for example, in this case the cantilever to move above the uh, substrate. We have also talked about extensions of this approach, this approach to build complicated looking uh, you know gear chains and other geometries by including a process known as chemical mechanical polishing that essentially smoothens the surface which would eventually result in uh, completely planar layers to be built above the silicon surface. This facilitates as you may have seen in other lectures nearly perfectly looking uh, and complicated uh, geometries. We have also talked about a dissolved wafer process in which we can have part of the device on one wafer and the other part on a, a different wafer and bond these together and later dissolve a part of the let us say one of those wafers to come out with a geometry which would be you know attached to the other and you know which can also move by application of external forces. And all these were essentially following a similar uh, process a similar set of process sequences of deposition, uh, patent transfer, etching and possibly bonding and some of these being you know repeated several times. In this context, I also wish to talk to you about a recent book on microsystems that is uh, authored by the team that is uh, put together this lecture series. Uh, an Indian edition is currently available and we expect that uh, international edition to come out in 2011. This book covers uh, all the aspects that have been covered in this uh, lecture series, including introduction to microsystems and, and uh, you know a summary of all the microfabrication technologies that I have talked to you about, modeling and finite element methods, especially for mechanical structures. We will also have a, a chapter on electronic circuits that are required in the context of sensors and actuators, their integration with uh, you know the uh, packaging and integration with electronics and packaging and uh, similar topics. Coming back to the topic of uh, today's lecture that is on non-conventional approaches. So, whatever we have seen in the uh, previous flow chart is uh, we will treat them as this conventional approach wherein we follow the uh, steps typically followed in a uh, microelectronics foundry. 
and in some cases tweak them or extend them a bit to realize freestanding structures. In this particular lecture, I would like to talk to you more about materials and methods that are not so frequently used in a typical microelectronics fabrication process. So, this would involve what could be called as non-conventional materials or non-conventional processing of some of those materials. The objective here is to make relatively thicker geometries. So, in the context of high aspect ratio geometries that we have talked in another context, these are in a sense extensions of those. We will see by doing by incorporating these new materials, how some of the some of the new features could be exploited. For example, you all know that most polymers are much more flexible than metals or even silicon. So, the low value of Young's modulus of these polymers could be used to build elastic uh, structures. Several ceramic materials that you will see being used in the context of micro systems are there because they have peculiar sensing characteristics or they could be exploited for building sensor devices or even actuation devices. You will see especially in the context of polymers, there are several low cost processing and possibilities. For example, molding you are familiar with which could all which could be used for be, you know replicating a large number of uh, parts. In most cases that you will see today, the device need not be packaged separately and may not also contain much of electronics uh, built on silicon uh, for their operation. The LIGA process has been explained in another lecture in more detail. It essentially starts with a silicon kind of a conventional kind of a process, wherein you do a pattern transfer, but in this case it is done using an X-ray lithography. Why X-rays are used? Because we would want to have vertically thick geometries. So, the photoresist has to be thick and to expose such a thick resist, we would need uh, optical lithography may not work deep into the resist. So, we would need to use uh, x-rays for this purpose. And we played through the hole that is created to create uh, the a, 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 a template which could be used to building molds and which could eventually be used for replicating a large number of parts. Polymers are uh, becoming to be very popular choice for building many low cost micro systems. As you all know these are flexible and in most cases chemically and biologically compatible and are available in many varieties and can be fabricated into really through 3D shapes. We have seen molding and other approaches of plastics. Most of these materials and their fabrication methods are relatively far less expensive and you usually do not even use them in clean rooms. So, that kind of an infrastructure will not be required to build most of the micro systems that you will see uh, using polymers. Polymer microsystems 
have particular advantages when you only are looking for moderate performance devices with the key point low cost or disposable characteristics. This need no, we do not have to worry about packaging this separately unlike silicon based devices which are typically fragile. There is an increasing possibility of in incorporating polymer microsystems with organic thin film transistors. Not much work has been done on this, but there is serious possibility of such an integration. So, it is possible to have a completely integrated microsystem without silicon. Many polymers as I have alluded to earlier used in microsystems are biocompatible and therefore, can be directly used for medical applications. Polymers come in various forms and therefore, their applications can also be of various forms. In fact, it is possible to identify structural polymers or polymers which would work as structures for microsystems or even uh, sacrificial material. So, the surface micro machining that we have seen in the context of silicon could be extended for building micro systems, polymeric micro systems made entirely of polymeric materials. So, we can use, we can choose UV curable polymers which would re, uh, which could be eventually used as structural materials or could be eventually dissolved without actually affecting some of the others. So, it is uh, possible to select some of the uh, polymeric uh, some of the materials uh, which uh, in such a way that in a way exactly similar to how we build polysilicon based structures on silicon substrate. We will see some of these as we go by in this lecture. Photoresses are very commonly used in silicon foundries. Polyamides and PMMA are also used to a lesser extent. One material that is you know fast becoming popular for various applications in uh, micro systems is known as SU8. This is a uh, epon resist and it comes uh, with different viscosity levels which could eventually be used for a wide range of thicknesses. This can be used as a structural material in micro systems and as you could see here it has this kind of chain of polymeric chain which essentially consists of these 8 rings usually and hence this 8 in this name. A wide range of applications have been developed based on SU8. In microelectronics, in microfluidics, in packaging and even by incorporating other materials into it, it could even be used for as magnetic material, magnetic films. There are several examples that can be shown uh, based on fabri uh, fabrication uh, with SU8. Can build cylindrical geometries with high reasonably high aspect ratio. Can have pillars, you can have cross connected structures can have free stain uh, cantilevers or beams all made of SU8. The process steps are somewhat similar to 
the photoresist that you are familiar with. We essentially dissolve the resin of AC8 in an organic solvent and then you know uh, based on the composition of this we can get we can control the viscosity and hence the thickness and this is been uh, coated on the surface and it is essentially you know exposed to UV light as in the case of photoresist and which will eventually enable the cross linking of the polymers and one can get you know a highly branched polymeric epoxy resin on top of the substrate surface. So, this is an you know the process and everything is quite similar to what is done for the case of uh, photoresist in a typical silicon foundry. Polymeric other polymeric materials that could be used include polyethylene which has very good chemical resistance is a low cost material you see it everywhere and good electrical insulation properties and it is transparent and can be processed relatively easily. Polyvinyl chloride is also an electrical insulation material and is a good uh, has good resistance to weathering. PVDF is a polyvinylidene fluoride and has piezoelectric properties and hence can be used in place of uh, you know ceramic materials such as PZT that is lead zirconium titanate which are used in piezoelectric uh, sensors and actuators. So, PVDF based sensors and actuators could be made uh, and which is essentially a highly pliable uh, flexible polymeric material. Other materials include PTFE, polyvinyl acetate, polyamide, polystyrene, polybutylene tetraphthalate poly either either ketone and the like. As I mentioned PVDF has very good piezoelectric properties. There are other polymers such as polypyrrole which has very good conductivity characteristics and uh, hence could be used to make the electrical connections just as conductors. In fact, the conductivity of uh, Polyperol can be you know uh, controlled by doping as you do in the case of silicon or polysilicon. Other uh, interesting uh, polymers which uh, has sensing or actuation applications include uh, fluorosilicon or silicon which has electrostative characteristics which could which have been explored in the context of building actuators. <coughs> Fabricating structures with polymeric uh, materials is relatively easy. One can use various molding possibilities to replicate large number of parts using polymers. I will also talk about an extension of lithography kind of technique known as micro stereolithography which is used for forming three dimensional structures of micron scale made of polymeric materials. There are a couple of varieties of this and we will see that in detail as we go by. In another context I talked to you about soft lithography and we will see how this could be uh, you know this compares with the conventional lithography processes. So, 
to look at it more closely, the first thing that we need to understand is what are the real limitations of conventional lithography. Obviously, conventional lithography approaches are useful for planar surfaces. We do the pattern transfer from a hard mask and the surface to which it is transferred should be parallel to it to get good reproducibility. So, using the conventional lithography, we can only make two dimensional micro structures and we have seen that how it, this could be tweaked to get uh, uh, you know slight uh, somewhat marginally three dimensional I would put it as surface micro machined geometries. It is not always possible to generate patterns of uh, you know certain chem uh, specific chemical functions over the surface you have to you know deposit everything all over the surface and then pattern it separately. In uh, uh, you know uh, photo sensitive materials in devices may not be patterned as you know it may be necessary to attach additional functional materials into this to you know to make it to uh, cure under this photo uh, UV exposure that is required in most cases of the conventional lithography. So, these could be overcome by the process known as soft lithography. This essentially uses an elastomeric stamp which is patterned with a pattern relief structure on this and is used to generate multiple number of patterns and structures. And using soft lithography one can make features with sizes ranging from you know possibly sub nano sub micrometers as low as 30 nanometer to even hundreds or more of micrometers. It provides uh, an approach, a convenient approach and which is a low cost method for fabricating these small structures. Several uh, you know techniques are available uh, under the umbrella of soft lithography and things such as micro contact printing, replica molding, micro transfer molding. Some of these will be discussed in little detail as we go by. So, the, the basic differences between photolithography and soft lithography are compiled here. In photolithography, we use a rigid hard photo mask plate. In soft lithography, we use an elastomeric stamp usually made of a, a material called PDMS. Photolithography is applied onto planar surfaces, whereas soft lithography can be extended towards a planar as well as non planar structures. S materials that can be patterned using photolithography include photoresis and some mono layers on gold or silicon dioxide, whereas a large variety of materials could be patterned using soft lithography approaches and it can be even used for patterning macrobiological molecules. L mostly two-dimensional structures can be fabricated using photolithography and using soft lithography we can extend this towards three dimensional structures. The lower limit of the structures that can be fabricated using large scale conventional photolithography is of the order of tens of nanometers and these limits keep changing. But 
the limit is much higher in the case of soft lithography and one can only build as low as about a micron or something like that using soft lithography. So, the minimum feature sizes could be you know even though the minimum feature sizes could be comparable. So, as I mentioned several micro molding techniques including injection molding, hot imposing, jet molding or replica molding or even micro transfer molding could be used for building relatively high aspect ratio micro structures. There are some extensions of these which could be used even for thin micro structures. But the key steps in molding such structures would involve making a sol uh, dissolve the material in a solvent and then degas this essentially remove all the bubbles in the dissolved uh, solution and then deposit or transfer it onto the on to some kind of a mold and then cure it then remove it from the small known as demold. So, for many plastic and ceramic materials such molding techniques are now fairly established. The master molds that we use for this purpose could be made of polymers, metal or even or silicon based structure. Polymers as I have mentioned previously, PDMS is one of the example. Masters made, uh, these uh, masters are made using photolithography or as you will see stereolithography and other approaches. Metal masters could be made by electroplating or liga we have seen or similar processes. Silicon masters could be made using you know the etching techniques that we have seen previously. So, in simple terms the process of micro molding would involve the resist coating and lithography and then using the elastomer uh, doing this pattern transfer and taking out this mold insert. As I mentioned polydimethyl siloxane known popularly as PDMS it can be easily fabricated and can be used for you know large scale production of polymeric devices uh, as a mold material can be even used for building micro reactors, micro chips and various other fluidic systems. This can be used to replicate structures all the way down to micron or smaller in size. And it has very good, it can result in uh, geometries with very good surface finish and obviously by molding approaches. It has very good optical properties and uh, uh, can be extended for you know various optical detection schemes, uh, sensing schemes in while building micro systems and is therefore widely used in biochemical uh, analysis. It has relatively no uh, absorption of visible light, so it is a transparent material. It has very good adhesion to flat surfaces. So, using PDMS microstructures can be even sealed by just pasting the chip onto the flat surface. In contrast, 
microfluidic devices uh, which have you know micro channels or chambers realized using the bonding process would require you know the extensive silicon glass bonding pro you know high temperature silicon glass bonding approaches to for you know capping them. But this uh, bonding of PDMS to this hard surface flat surface is reversible and therefore this can be easily replaced uh, and the substrate can be washed and reused. So, which uh, is a very good advantage for PDMS based microstructures. What results is essentially called a hybrid structure of PDMS and glass or even PDMS and PMMA for microfluidic channels and biomedical applications. So, it is possible to add functional devices such as heaters, microheaters or temperature sensors on top of the substrate and the fluidic part could be on the PDMS part of this device. So, such hybrid structures are possible even using PDMS. So, the it is a relatively simple process to fabricate PDMS glass micro chambers. What you need to do is essentially mix the PDMS commercially available with the solvent and maybe put them into aluminum molds and put it in a vacuum oven to degas it at a relatively low temperature for you know several tens of minutes that would remove all the bubbles because if the bubbles are there you know in the fabricated structures would become uh, you know unreliable sometimes. Then after it is molded and uh, uh, it is uh, covered with a glass slide and uh, it could be sealed uh, and then we can reproduce a large number of these by uh, cleaning the glass by a methanol spray. So, after sealing with this glass this PDMS can be easily trimmed because it is a very flexible material. So, for example, we can build uh, sensing devices, sensing cartridges with uh, a part on hard material and part on uh, PDMS. So, that we can even build a biochemical reactor for uh, biosensing applications. So, the glass cover can be used to seal it and can be used which is uh, transparent and can therefore, be used for microscopy to monitor the cells and things like that. So, it is a relatively simple and easy process to build such structures and has been this can has been extended for a number of applications primarily biological and glass with even transparent electrodes has also been developed which could also be used for similar uh, as electrodes. To build uh, mold molds at micron scale, we can even build a master made of SU8 as if you recall from our earlier discussion SU8 is one material which can be made in different thicknesses. So, when you want to bring it down to micron scale appropriate thickness of SU8 can be you know exposed to UV light and you can build microstructures using them and then use those to build molds of PDMS or parts and then which can be 
you know replicated a number of times. So, the process steps would involve spin coating and patterning and uh, you know a plasma treatment then this pre polymer which is poured onto it and cured and it can be peeled off and pasted onto a, a substrate and can be used as a sealed cavity and the like. There are uh, possibilities uh, extended to build a complete PCR chip for DNA amplification uh, using these approaches. A somewhat similar approach uh, is known as micro transfer molding. In this case, multilayer microstructures can be fabricated. Once again, polymeric materials are formed uh, on even non planar surfaces. This can be used as I have been talking about three dimensional structures and even extended for ceramic microstructures at micron scales. PDMS could be used once again and uh, you know it is uh, it works similar to what we have seen previously. So, we first make this mold and then use PDMS to uh, you know uh, do the uh, use the mold to create the PDMS based structure and then use this for repetitive produce production. A slightly different approach of fabricating three dimensional structures using polymers is known as stereolithography. This is developed about 20, 30 years ago and has been initially used for building mesoscale structures on polymers. What is done is to use a beam of curing UV light and has a substrate and when this is inserted into a vat of photo curable solution and it is cured one layer at a time. So, what is done is that this substrate that is there will be lowered by the thickness of a layer and then the, the solution will cover this surface and after that you cure the surface for the part that we want to build. So, after each step we will move this substrate by the thickness of each layer. So, a layer by layer fabrication of three dimensional structures are possible. With today's CAD tools it is relatively easy to make such layer by layer slices of any complicated three dimensional structure. So, with these two dimensional slices patterns are transferred onto this liquid that forms over the substrate. So, the z axis movement essentially controls the thickness whereas, the scanned UV beam would control the two dimensional shape of each layer. So, the desired object can eventually be built out of this solution. This has been extended to micro parts by better control of all this movement and uh, scanning of the beam. Once again, the system would consist of this polymeric resin and this uh, laser focusing arrangement and a kind of movement arrangement which would be controlled computer controlled based on the CAD design. The light is uh, the beam is basically allowed to fall on the top layer of this resin in a controlled fashion so that the shapes could be formed based on that. 
So, in micro stereolithography which is a relatively newer technique, one can build three dimensional structures made of primarily made of polymers in a process in processes which are very similar to those used in silicon fabrication and in a approach which is also a layer by layer approach, three dimensional structures are possible. So, in some cases one may need to use sacrificial layers to build structural layers above that, but uh, in many cases it is possible to do without. So, we need to control the viscosity of the solution so that it covers uniformly over this surface, so that continuous coverage would be possible. Several variants of stereolithography approaches are possible. As you know the scanning based approach would be relatively slow because you are essentially exposing a one pixel at a time. LCD based projection methods have also been ex experimented with for building a volume production using micro stereolithography. These are some of the variants of the micro stereolithography approaches for building microstructures. Some of the problems include you know limitations in focusing uh, these beams into the solution and the thickness that one can get and the kind of controls that one can have on the mirror movement as well as on the stage movement. There are several modifications are being made on some of these things to improve the characteristics of the structures. To summarize, the Polymers have several interesting characteristics which could be exploited to build functional microsystems. They have very good elastic moduli, so that larger deformation could be realized. Good dimensional stability and long term environmental stability are other characteristics usually have good electric and chemical characteristics for most polymers. So, polymer microsystems are very likely to be become highly popular in the near future. Many ceramic materials have already been discussed in the context of microsystems. We have also talked about various ways of depositing dielectric materials and such as RF sputtering or pulse laser deposition in the context of silicon based thin films. These could be extended for depositing uh, ceramic materials. You will see that ceramic materials, some ceramic materials could also be used based on uh, fabricated sorry based on the polymeric approaches that we have seen earlier today. These have wide range of sensing and actuation applications and in rare cases they have uh, peculiar characteristics that are not there in most of the other materials that you have seen previously. For example, barium titanate and other materials have nonlinear characteristics which could be exploited in many microsystems with specialized applications. If you recall electrostatic actuators are very popular in microsystems because it only requires electrodes or silicon based materials which could therefore be fabricated be with approaches that are common with silicon foundries. With ceramic materials included, we have new possibilities of actuation 
including piezoelectric or electrostative methods of actuation. Their deposition schemes as I have mentioned, we have seen sputtering in another context. It involves creation of a plasma and these ions will uh, you know hit the target and replace atoms from the target material or molecules which could be transferred onto the substrate or wafer which is kept in the anode. To facilitate we need a vacuum so that we can create the plasma inside this chamber. This uh, obviously the DC plasma is useful for metal materials whereas for dielectrics we typically use RF magnetron based sputtering schemes. We can therefore uh, have very good high purity films in this approach. It is also possible to uh, deposit multiple compositions using multiple targets onto the same uh, wafer and by arranging the angles of loca or locations of these targets, one can even control the deposition rate as well as the composition. The sputtering yield would depend on a large a number of factors including the angle of incidence of these ions, the energy of the ion and the mass of the ion and the surface bonding energy of the atoms of the target. Wide range of materials can be deposited using this approach. These have very good adhesion characteristics and uh, it is possible to make films of complex stoichiometric uh, forms. Films can be deposited over a relatively large wafer areas. They compared to some of the other methods of deposition it is probably a little more costly and things like Another approach that we have seen in the context of silicon is based on laser ablation. In this case, rather than using this ionic bombardment, we use a laser beam to displace the molecules, which essentially goes and hits the substrate. In the case of many ceramic materials, we use the uh, technique known as pulsed laser ablation deposition which can result in high purity thin films of uh, ceramic materials and can be used for high reproducibility and as in the case of sputtering the processing variables include the laser energy and the laser pulse repetition rate because it is a pulsed approach, the temperature of the substrate and the uh, background pressure. For ceramics, thin films, there are several other approaches are also pursued. One of them is known as the sol gel approach. This is uh, useful for depositing materials such as uh, lead zirconium titanate and PMN which has electrostatic properties. In this example, it is shown that this is deposited over a cantilever structure on micro machined silica and electrodes are patterned on both sides of this material. So, with this one can actually build a vibrating cantilever and even can be the vibration can be sensed using this. So, in sol gel process what you essentially have is a sol which is a colloidal suspension of solid particles in a polymeric liquid form. So, this is essentially formed by a series of process steps of uh, solid state reactions and then 
forming fine powders of this material of very uh, low uh, dimensions. And then we may disperse this in a polymer and create a gel and this would be deposited onto the substrate and will be used. So, the process parameters could therefore be uh, based on the ratio of the uh, powder to the liquid and the temperatures of uh, curing and the pH of the solution and the reaction time. Advantages of sol gel process uh, include that it can be used for metal oxides very easily and can be which can be actually doped with additional compounds because you are starting with a solid state reaction. So, these powders could be mixed and then these could be used. So, a large area homogeneous film can be obtained with this and this can be used uh, for you know without using vacuum. So, the sol gel method offers high purity and ensures homogeneity of elements even at the molecular level. So, typical process steps would therefore involve substrate cleaning and then spin coating this precursor solution onto the substrate and coating it. Then just as your other process, we you keep it on the hot plate for 15 minutes and then you put it in a furnace for several hundreds of degrees centigrade and then uh, keep it there for what is called a process known as sintering. In some cases, we can also do an annealing to create this ceramic film. So, when it is in this uh, mixed with this polymer, the ceramic uh, the powder particles are dispersed like this and when we actually do a polymer burnout, these powders will actually be you know loose particles in some sense. So, this could actually be gelled together to form uh, stable products by the process known as sintering. This approach can even be used along with microstereolithography. If you recall in microstereolithography, we have this uh, polymeric resin uh, which is uh, cured. So, we disperse this metallic particle, uh, the uh, ceramic particles in it and then you know we fire this, uh, you know sinter this and it can, it has been shown that you know three dimensional parts could be made by this approach. Another interesting approach for building ceramic uh, uh, parts is known as uh, LTCC, low temperature co-fired ceramics. Single sheets are available commercially which are essentially stacked together and uh, sintered, fired at a relatively lower temperature than conventional ceramics and hence this name low temperature co-fired ceramics. It starts with making these tapes of this which are or the green tapes of the ceramics which are slit into pieces and then via holes are punched onto these sheets and then this could be filled if required by metal conductors so that multilayer contacts could be made and then we use screen printing to transfer patterns onto the, uh, the, the top layer. And these are then stacked together by registering properly and have uh, with good alignment and these are laminated and pressed together using an isostatic press, press and then cut into individual devices and fired with a predetermined temperature cycle. So, with this approach one can actually start from these individual layers of green tips and build uh, multi-layer structures. This has been shown to be useful in building micro reactors 
or uh, flow meters uh, using these approaches uh, with the LTCC based approach. Conductor materials are possible, resistive materials are possible using these approaches, but the key is that one can get self packaged uh, devices integrated even with electrical interconnects by this approach. So, what we have seen so far is various approaches of building micro systems and what we have seen towards the end is that with some of these non-conventional approaches, it is in fact possible to build packaged micro systems. One aspect that we have not yet discussed is how we actually package and what are the issues in packaging micro systems when you build them using silicon. So, we will talk about that in another lecture and I thank you for listening.